As you're taking the seat, open up your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 is where we're going to be. And hey, I got to um, share a little, a little inside, you know, kind of look behind the scenes with you guys this morning and let you know what's happening up here that you may not see unless I'll let you in on the joke. Um, Take a look, okay, because it's, it's hard to see probably from your vantage point, but this is what I find greeting me uh, on the podium this morning, right here. You see that? Uh-huh. Little, little power T right there, okay? If you've been around for a while, you know this is not my deal right here. One, one win over ETSU, uh-huh, and getting a little cocky right there. Hey, as a side note, I, I told somebody the other day, I have made so many jokes, you know, about football and about Tennessee and, you know, and Georgia and, you know, stuff like this. I'm a Georgia fan uh, that I have already resigned myself to the fact, by the way, I have a, an idea or two who this may be. Um, God will take vengeance. But that's beside the point. Um, I have already resigned myself to the fact that when the day comes that Tennessee beats Georgia, now, it could be millennia from now. I don't know when it will be. But when that day comes, I am pretty sure that this room will sing Rocky Top. I, I've just already resigned myself to that fact. Matter of fact, I'll go one better than that. The day you guys beat us, I will sing Rocky Top with you guys from the stage. <laughs> Matt Day shaking his head like, you cannot do that. Like, you're going to lose your salvation. I mean, he's, he's like, no, there, there's no way. Just so y'all know that it's all in good fun, I will, I will do it with you guys on that day. So again, um, I, who, who did this? I got a couple of good ideas. Uh, on the lunch that's following this, I don't know if you were here, you were part of the announcements. Uh, we're having a lunch for people who are new to the church, who just want more information about the church, who want to know who we are, how we practice ministry, who want to be able to uh, ask questions, you know, how, want to know how to get involved, things like that. We want you to know that you're invited. Uh, we, we brought more food in, much more than how, you know, the number that we had RSVP'd for. Um, and, and I don't know how that'll work out. We tried to over-prepare. But regardless, uh, I want you guys to know that you're invited. And that's the purpose of that lunch, is to let you know a little bit more about the background of the church, who we are, how we, uh, how we see ministry, uh, and to let you be able to ask some questions. So you're invited to that as soon as the uh, service concludes today. All right. So all that being said, and a little bit of fun thrown in there, as well. Uh, let's pray together, and then we'll open up the Word. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the fellowship of your people. And Father, I, I'm just so blessed by watching the community of our church grow in such a short period of time. And Father, I, I just give you praise for that, um, because you're the one that produces true fellowship. It's a mark of your Holy Spirit. And uh, we're, we're just really grateful for that. And Father, we also say at the same time, we know it needs to continue to grow. Um, we know it needs to grow for many specific individuals that are in here and for us corporately as a church. It needs to grow, it needs to develop, it needs to mature, it needs to deepen, it needs to strengthen. And we're asking for your grace and mercy to see that happen as well. And right now in this moment, Father, as is our custom, we just confess that, that you are the singular author of your word. Inspired by your Holy Spirit, written down by the hands of finite mortal men. Um, and you're the one that, it, that determines its interpretation and uh, what's supposed to be done with it. You are the single standard for truth, and your word is true. And as uh, Sam talked about in, in our tip time for our serve team today, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I pray that this would be a time that as we hear your word, as we truly listen to your spirit, that our faith would grow and it would deepen. And we know that it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that that can be accomplished in us. We thank you, Father. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, the title of the message this morning is Missing the Mark. Missing the Mark. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. We're going to concentrate on verses 5 through 7, and then we're going to very quickly wrap up with the last few verses. Uh, but we are going to focus on those first few. But first, you know, i got to tell you guys, if you haven't figured it out by now, I like to have a little bit of fun during this time. Have you all not figured that out at this point? Okay, I enjoy this. I feel like God has designed me for this. As a part of that, I, I think sometimes we have an enjoyment in, in walking in and using our spiritual gifts. By the, you know, besides the fact that I actually like most of y'all. Okay, 
that's a little bit of fun. You're like, is that sarcasm? What was he talking about? I'm just having fun with you guys. I, I like to enjoy this time, and I want you to enjoy this time as well. And I don't typically tell jokes just for the purpose of entertaining y'all, but I look at this as like a conversation. Um, and it's just a part of my personality and who God wired me to be, so it just kind of comes out in this setting. It's not, it's not pretend or anything like that. We're just kind of having fun. But can we be honest to say that not all jokes hit home in the same way? Is that true? Sometimes do jokes miss the mark? Do they miss the mark? Any of y'all tell a joke every once in a while and it misses the mark and it just turns into a really awkward moment? Okay. Uh, I have, a, I have a, uh, a, you know, probably a greater privilege than even a lot of you guys do to see that happen from time to time. It happens right here, right now, and we just have to laugh on it. You need to laugh about it and just go on about our business. I had a really good one recently, though. Okay. I want y'all to get the scene here. Okay. I am at, at Camp Lookout okay, uh, on the backside of Lookout Mountain doing a wedding for, you know, a, a, a guy who was born on Sand Mountain, okay, and a woman who was born in Tajikistan. Are y'all following me right now? Now, we've already got some stuff going on there. Her family barely speaks any English. They speak Russian, and they were raised in, in you know, uh, culturally Muslim homes, all right? That's their background. Plus, this couple, they met doing ministry for nations over in Chattanooga. And so they have been ministering to immigrants that have been coming in out of all variety of Muslim nations coming into our country, many of whom speak Arabic. So we're, we're at Camp Lookout with the redneck pastor preaching a wedding sermon to people that speak Russian and Arabic and English. And it was translated into Russian and Arabic. Are y'all getting the scene right now? So... This, the bride's greatest desire out of this wedding is she's been preaching the gospel faithfully to her family and especially to her mom. Her greatest desire is that her mom will come to faith in the gospel. And she wants me to go for it. She wants me, she's not worried about this or that or appearance or what any other guests think or anything else. She wants me to just go for it. She wants it to be an overt presentation of the gospel, Okay. Now, I'm kind of me, too, so a little bit of me gets put in there sometimes. It just happens that way when I start to teach. And so here I am. I haven't necessarily... I've planned my approach, and I'm going to take some Old Testament stories, and I'm going to show how they're symbolic of Jesus Christ. Not that this is revelatory or groundbreaking, but I'm going to find common ground with my Muslim brother or sister, not in faith, but just in humanity, and I'm going to find common ground in the beginning of the Bible, but then demonstrate through the New Testament how these are all images of Jesus Christ. So I take two stories out of Genesis and I show how they're foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Then I take two stories out of Exodus and I show how they're foreshadowing of, of Jesus Christ. And then without planning it, just because I am who I am, this line comes out and I say, now at this point, and this room is crowded and it is hot and every phrase I say has to be translated into English from redneck, then into you know, Russian and then into Arabic. So this takes like four times as long because I talk so slow as it would any other place. And then at that point I say, now I'm going to give you two more examples of symbolic representations of Jesus Christ from the remaining 64 chapters of the Bible. And everybody, all the English speakers in the room, just literally stared at me. <laughs> there was not even a chuckle. Like, not, not nothing. Like, I saw nobody put their hands over their mouths like they were being polite. I just saw blank expressions and stares out of an entire room of 200 plus people. And then... The best part of it, it gets translated into Russian and nobody laughs. And it gets translated into Arabic and nobody laughs. So I got to watch the joke, miss the mark, three <laughs> times in a row. It was fantastic. It was awesome. Not everything hits the mark that we intend it to. And a life of faith is no different from that. As a matter of fact, we're going to come across the word sin in our passage today. And y'all may already know it, and if you don't already know it, I'm giving it away. It's foreshadowing. What is the simple working definition of the word sin? What is it? It is to miss the mark. There's a mark of faith. There's a right mark. 
And oftentimes, we miss the mark, okay? We're going to look at a passage today, and we're going to try not to get lost in it, where Peter gives us a lot of qualities that are essential parts, components that are built upon the foundation of our faith. And while we can get lost in trying to make all the little connections and trying to remember the definitions of all the words, I want you to stay. I I don't want you to lose the forest for the trees, so to speak. I want you to look for the big point of what is the mark of our faith? What is it supposed to accomplish? How is it supposed to culminate? And if I have missed that mark, then I have a reminder that I need to go back and look at the foundation of my faith and to see how it can be strengthened. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Now for this very reason. okay. As Peter starts out verse 5, he gives us a phrase that reminds us he's pointing back to something that he's already said. Now what he's pointing back to is verse 4. Go back and look at verse 4 from last week. I'm going to pick up in the middle of verse 4. So that by them, meaning the promises of God, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So what I'm talking about right now is we pick up in verse 5, what we're talking about is still taking part in the divine nature. Becoming partakers of the divine nature. What it looks like in our lives to have the nature of God and the nature of Jesus Christ so that we are experiencing victory over the world. So it's a continuing thought from where we were last week. Back to verse 5. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith supply. Now I'm going to read it one more time, and we're going to go through the next couple of verses just so we don't break the thought. But I wanted you to see that first part because I want it repeated because we're going to come back to it and take a couple things away from it here in just a second. Verse 5, now for this very reason, that we will be partakers of the divine nature, escaping the world of corruption and its lusts, okay? Also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. In your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Now, that's where we can get lost. This was my difficulty in this passage today, and it has been before as I've studied it, as I kind of have a mind that logically wants to understand what every word means, how each word is connected, why this one is used in this order, why did it go from this one to this one to this one to this one, what's the connection, what's the flow of thought, like all these kinds of things. Any of my other people out there, did you feel that way? Okay, listen, I, 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 you know, that's great. That's good. We should pursue that. What I'm telling you is today, we're probably not going to reach that level of understanding in the time that we have. So we'll talk about some of those things, but we're not going to go in depth into all those connections. But again, I'm just exhorting you not to miss the forest for the trees. Keep your eye on the mark and kind of the theme of what's happening here. Now, back to verse 5. Now, for this reason also, applying all diligence in your faith supply. I'm stopping right there at an odd point in the scripture because you have two commands and I have two commands in that half of a verse right there. What are those two commands? What's the first one? Talk to me. Apply all diligence. Okay. Very simply put, what this means is that if you look at the word diligence, it literally means to make haste. Okay. It means to hurry. The basic idea here is, well, here's, here's another probably better even word for this that I want you all to get out of this. It means zeal, to be zealous for something. Because when you're zealous for something, are you slow to go about it? No. It's, it's almost in the sense that the opposite of this thought would be procrastination. See, why do you procrastinate on things? Tell me, why do you procrastinate? Because you don't want to do it. Because that's the worst thing I have to do. Let me do the most fun thing that I have to do. I'll focus on that. I have zeal for that. I don't want to do this. I'm going to put it off. I'm going to procrastinate on it. This is the opposite. And this is a command to people in the body of Christ to apply or to add all haste. To add or to give all zeal. And I mean all. I don't mean just a little bit. I'm not just talking about a little bit of excitement. I'm talking... I want you to think about it like this. 
Y'all ever had sweet tea in Virginia? You're like, what are you talking about? Okay. Yeah, Virginia is just southern enough that some of the restaurants start offering sweet tea. But I need you to know, it is a counterfeit, it is an imitation, it is from the depths of the pit of hell, okay? <laughs> you see, because it has just a little bit of sugar in it, okay? I'm talking about Georgia sweet tea right now, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about where they mix it while they just take the bag of sugar, pouring it into the tea as they mix until the consistency resembles something of molasses. <laughs> Praise be to God, all right? <laughs> Right? That's what I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about adding all of it. That's the idea here in the passage is that we add all the zeal. Like we put it all in there. This is taking excitement and ramping it up a notch. That we are zealous, that we hasten, that we are fast to be about God's business and about our faith. And then it goes to the second command. What's the second command after applying all diligence? What's that? It's supply, okay? Supply is yet another word. These are very similar. It's another word for add, okay? So you almost had two different terms that both told you to add something to your faith. So it's really interesting. Is faith itself the completely finished product? Yes or no? It's not. We're actually commanded in the passage to add something to our faith, all right? We'll talk about that some more as we go. I want to give you another image for this word supply, though. Another literally literal meaning for this word supply is to lead in a chorus. I think that's really interesting when you look at the characteristics that come next, okay? Because in a chorus, let's say you got a group of people and they're singing together. You got your altos and your sopranos and your, your bass and your tenor, and I just listed everything I know about music right there, okay? You, you've got all of these different parts, all of these different voices, all these different, you know, whatever. And they need to be on the same page so that it works together to produce something that's beautiful when it works together. And y'all know, do choruses always work together? They don't. When the things aren't lined up correctly, then what you get as a product, what you get as a result, does not always sound beautiful. Now, that's really interesting in the context of this passage, because right after this, Peter goes into this description of seven different characteristics that we're supposed to supply to our faith. And he uses a term where they're supposed to add up together to produce something that is very beautiful. And what we're concerned with today, the main thing we're concerned with is, okay, what is the mark that we're going to? What is the mark that we're looking for? What is the culmination of our faith? What is it supposed to look like in the end result? How do these things add upon one another into a beautiful chorus so that our faith is everything that it is supposed to be? But before we get there, here's our first point of application today. And if I haven't said it the last couple of weeks, this has been on the tip of my tongue, if I haven't said it, but here it is. There is no neutral in a life of faith. There is no neutral in a life of faith. You see, both of these words are imperative commands. They are continual actions that we are supposed to provide the zeal for that we are supposed to do in partnership with God as a part of our faith. They are all about our personal responsibility. They're about taking initiative. They're about taking ownership. They're about being invested. It's about what God has asked me to do as a partner in faith with Him. Do you guys understand that? It is all about personal responsibility. And now, this may be a little bit of an opinionated statement, but I feel this way more and more the older and, and hopefully more mature in the faith I get. I do not think we ever stay the same spiritually. I feel like in my life, I am either growing or I am sliding. And I think if you took my life of sanctification and I would be willing to put some money on it, well, maybe not, I would be willing to bet as a figure of speech, that your life of sanctification, if you put it on a graph, although it should be going up from where we started towards the Lord, right? That our sanctification biblically should be growing. It typically looks like this, doesn't it? Doesn't it typically look like that? Why? Because I don't think there's any neutral in a life of faith. 
I think we're growing or we're sliding. And I think that has to be a reminder to us and it has to be a warning that if I'm not growing, I know I'm going in the wrong direction. All right? And it has to remind us to be alert, to be sober, to be watchful, and to go back and apply diligence and to supply, to add the things that Peter is exhorting us with in the Scripture to our lives of faith. Now, let's get into the characteristics that he's talking about supplying. And I'm going to read it through one more time because we're going to get a little repetition today. But I'm going to add a word because I want you to get the drift of what he's saying here. Okay, So just follow me for just a second. Let's go back and start in verse 5. Now, for this reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, supply knowledge. And in your knowledge, supply self-control. And in your self-control, supply perseverance. And in your perseverance, supply godliness. And in your godliness, supply brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, supply love. Do you guys see how that's structured grammatically? That word supply is implied at every one of those junctures between all of those different characteristics, meaning that you are called by God to add those things to your faith. Called by God to do that. And if your first thought is, well, I don't know exactly how to do that, that's okay. Like, I'm all right with that. All I'm trying to convey to you is the personal responsibility that we have in a life of faith. That you need to think about these things. What are these things? How can I grow in these things? What is getting in the way of growing in these things? What needs to change? What, you know, what do I need to do better? Maybe even ask other people, mentors, people that disciple you. What do you see in me? Am I growing in godliness? Am I, am I godlike in the sense that I show these, these characteristics? You know, and start to ask yourself about these things and challenge yourself so that you're being intentional about them. The idea here is they don't just have happen because you're sitting around hoping they will, but that you take personal responsibility to be a part of the process. That's the thing that we have to understand and that we have to take ownership of. Now, let's talk very quickly about each of the qualities, okay? And then I'm only going to pull out maybe one or two applications that I really felt like the Lord laid on my heart uh, out of one of of these characteristics as we go. Verse 5. Now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. Moral excellence, I mean, I don't think there's any mystery you know, as to what this is. We're just talking about a, a moral truth and excellent, the right way to do things. The fact that we talked in the past that there is a right, that there is a wrong, and that God is the standard of it. And I think it makes perfect sense because then it goes from moral excellence and in your moral excellence... Supply knowledge. What is knowledge? Go back to last week. We talked all about knowledge being power. Knowledge, biblically speaking, is our pursuit. Again, personal responsibility. Our pursuit of a true understanding and even an experience of God. Pursuit of truth. And it even said one of the meanings of that word knowledge is precise and correct. Again, communicating to us that there is a right and there is a wrong, even when it comes to spiritual things and when it comes to to morality. Now, I want you to think about these. And I'm going to share, here's where I'm going to share a couple of application points around these couple of things right here, okay? Here's the first one. These are the two different groups that are right here in our audience today. First one is this. To the young, you need to add knowledge to your zeal. To the young folks that are in here, You need to add knowledge to your zeal. Younger generations tend to excel in the zeal and tend not to have as much knowledge to partner with it. And there's an intimate connection that you cannot break apart where these two concepts, where these two things are designed to go together. I'm going to read you a little passage, Romans 10, 1 through 3. You don't have to turn there, just write it down. But I want you to understand the importance of combining zeal with knowledge. Y'all check this out. This is scary. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. This is Paul talking about the Jews. Okay. Now, just from based on verse 1 and the context I just gave you, is he talking about people who are saved? Do they have a saving faith in Jesus Christ? Yes or no? No. Okay. 
My heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, the Jews, is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Do you guys see the importance of connecting zeal with knowledge? Y'all listen. According to the scripture we just read, not my own opinions, there can even be a zeal for God that is not rooted in salvation. Is that scary or not? That is scary. That was Paul, just so you understand that we're talking biblical terms here. You just read it. I didn't create that. But just so you understand, that was the definition of Paul before Damascus, right? He had a zeal for God. He thought he was doing the right thing. Now I want you to track with me for just a minute. Think about this in terms of morality. Because we just went from supply, add through your zeal, add to your moral excellence, knowledge. Is it important to have a true knowledge of God? Does that affect your moral choices? Does that determine whether they're morally excellent or not? Absolutely. Uh, I think of, uh, there's, a, guy, there's a, a rapper slash spoken word artist named Propaganda. He's got, a, he's got a song called Forgive Me for Asking. And he's speaking to, he's speaking to Muslims in the context of the song. And, he, and the basic idea is, hey, forgive me for asking if I'm stepping on anybody's toes. But has it never occurred to you that maybe... The, the jihadists are interpreting the Quran correctly, so they are walking in morality and you are lukewarm according to your faith. Do y'all, do y'all see what I'm saying? Because, see, here's the deal. If, if that segment of Islam is interpreting the Quran correctly, and if that is the truth of, of religion and, and God, if that is based on truth, then Killing infidels is morally excellent. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, what if your zeal is not connected to true knowledge? Can it hurt people? 100%. That's that's a warning, okay? Hey, young folks, listen. First of all, I need to say something before I say the next thing, okay? I need to say one thing before I say the next thing, because I don't want y'all to get the wrong idea. As a pastor, I would rather have some zealous people that are open to being taught but don't know a whole lot than a bunch of sticks in the mud who think they know everything. Okay? 100% honest with y'all. I would rather have you be zealous and at least open to learning. All right? That, personally. Here's the other side of the equation. Uh, How many of y'all are dog people? Okay. Well, passionate about it. Okay? (laughs) Passionate about that. All right, uh, I just came across a term lately uh, referring to dogs where the, the term was fraps, okay? You ever heard of fraps before? Okay, fraps, I had to write it down because I knew I would never remember it. Fraps is frenetic random activity periods, all right? Now, I knew what it was, even though I don't have a dog. This is when your dog, for no reason at all, starts running like a million miles an hour in circles around the house Jumping on everything, darting, dodging, acting like a maniac. You think it needs to be medicated. And like, what, like, what, what just happened? Like, I didn't do anything. I didn't try to scare it. I, it, just, it just happened, okay? I don't know exactly why, but this is something that is characteristic of dogs, more so in younger ones, a little bit less so in older ones, but it, apparently it's a normal thing. I also read that people just call them zoomies. That sounds like they did take something, okay? Um, th- this can be the younger generation sometimes in the church. Like, hey, I've got all this energy. i got to go do something. Like, let's do it. Let's go. Let's make it happen. Let's do it. Let's do it. Blah, blah. It went all over the place, like a million different directions. No, no real point, no focus, no, no attachment to truth, no, no initiative where, you know, where it's actually attached to the gospel. Um, it, it, can, it can be a lot of things, all right? And it's usually rooted in zeal. So I want you to understand, I'm not throwing rocks up here. I I am grateful for the zeal. But there is an exhortation to younger people in the church, according to the Word of God, to make sure that your zeal is connected to knowledge. So that the works are fruitful, okay, and useful before God. 
And I do want you to know, too, what will happen in the end, okay? A lot of times when you have the bad... <laughs> I just thought of a totally inappropriate joke. I'm sorry. I just, that one got me really bad. That was not planned, but it would have been really funny, I'm telling you, okay? Really, really funny, and I can't share it, okay? <laughs> if you got a bad case of the zoomies... <laughs> All right. Um, it, <laughs> it, it can take you in some wrong directions. And here's, here's how it'll manifest itself. Eventually, you know what'll happen? Eventually, you know what'll happen? You'll run out of that zeal, and you will get tired, and you will get burned out. That leads me to the next point of application. This is for the more mature folks in the audience. To the mature, add zeal to your knowledge. To the more mature folks, okay, to the older generations in the church, we need to add zeal to the knowledge that we have. I want to read you out of Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And that you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Now what's really interesting about this is he, that the church was just praised by Jesus for a lot of the same things that Peter is going to try to prepare the church to do in 2 Peter. It's fascinating. They just got praised for doing what Peter's going to teach us over the next couple months. And then he says something else. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Oh, man, that hurts, okay? Even deeds don't take the place, okay? Even being right, even knowledge, even godly knowledge, even a, a good, healthy knowledge of the Word and of who God is, it can't replace a life of love and of zeal. They're supposed to go hand in hand. And what we all will find in our life of faith is that we tend to be a little stronger in one than we are the other. Maybe we're a little more zealous than we are knowledgeable. Or maybe we're a little more knowledgeable than we are zealous. But as I'm speaking to the mature in the audience, do you know what this sounds like in the context of the church? Okay, Here's what this sounds like. Well, I, I did that already. I've already done my season, and I'm tired. The younger people need to do it. That's what it sounds like, okay? That is a, not the only, but that is a practical manifestation of having lost our zeal, even in all of our knowledge. And if that's offensive to you, okay, I want to ask you just to take the time just to go back and ask God and say, is that really true? Is, is that really true? Have I left my first love? Have I lost my zeal? And if that is the case, Father, whatever you need to do in me, help me to add the zeal back to my knowledge so that I can be fruitful and useful to the Master for every good work. Back to First Peter, Second Peter, excuse me, chapter 1. Let's go back to verse 5. In your faith supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence knowledge, precise, correct knowledge of God, pursuit of truth, and in your knowledge supply self-control, okay? I think everybody's pretty much down with self-control in terms of knowing what it means. It's simply the ability and the power to overcome our own lusts and temptations, okay? The ability for us to make our bodies, to, for us to master our bodies, and not our bodies to rule over and to master us. And in your self-control, supply perseverance. Okay, Perseverance is the same word that's translated in other places in Scripture as endurance. It's long-lasting. It's steadfastness. It's not deterred because things get hard and because the going gets tough. But in this case, when you have perseverance, the tough get going. They don't stop because of the circumstances that they encounter. So, in your self-control, supply endurance. Supply Another translation, by the way, for that, that would be really good for a lot of y'all to understand, is very simply one word, patience. Okay, 
Because often when we're in the midst of circumstances that we do not want to endure, we become highly impatient and we miss the move of God through whatever we're experiencing in that season. Endurance, another literal meaning, is patience. And in your perseverance, um, supply godliness. Very simply put, a God-likeness. Not in the sense that we can truly imitate God, but we are called to imitate Paul. And Paul imitates Christ. And Christ, according to Hebrews, is the exact representation of the nature of God. So is it not supposed to be a pursuit of each and every Christian to be more like our Heavenly Father? Yes or no? Yeah. Godliness. God-likeness. A God-wordness in terms of our disposition. In the sense that we direct ourselves, uh, you know, even our, our, our time and our energy and our resources towards Him. As opposed to towards all the things that are in the world through its corruption, through lust. And your godliness supply brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness, if you're taking notes, is the word phileo. Okay? Or Philadelphia. All right? Um, Phileo being a brotherly type of love, okay? An affection and a love, but for a certain group of people, for your brothers and brothers in the faith and perhaps even family members sometimes, okay? And in your brotherly kindness, supply love. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you guys get this. Brotherly kindness was a type of love. And then he uses the word love right after that. In your brotherly kindness, your brotherly love for one another, supply love. So what kind of love do you think he's talking about as he concludes the last quality? It's agape love. Okay? Unconditional love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love each person around you as God loved you, which was unconditionally. You didn't deserve it. In fact, you deserve the opposite of love because you sinned against a righteous, holy, heavenly Father who has a wrath, a holy, justified wrath against sin, yet He sacrificed the greatest sacrifice out of unconditional love so that you could be restored in relationship with Him. Okay, Love others in this way, agape love. That leads us to our next point of application. What is the culmination of all of these qualities that we are supposed to supply to our faith, y'all? It's love. Here it is up on the screen. If our faith does not culminate in love, then we have missed the mark. Y'all listen. We as believers, we can have some self-control. We can have some godliness. We can have some zeal. We can have some moral excellence. We can have some of all these characteristics. And you know, when it comes down to it, if anything's driving you crazy about, I want to know how they build on each other and why this one's there here and this one's next and all these kinds of things, again, pursue that. That's, that's a great pursuit and, and worth your time. All right? But if anybody's questioning anything here, they build on one another to make a beautiful chorus that results in the outward you know, life of the believer demonstrating agape, unconditional love towards other people that are around us. That is the result. That is the mark of, a, of faith. And as I started to say a minute ago, it kind of just simply reminds me about Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit. These qualities seem very similar in that regard. But it's interesting, when Paul approached that in Galatians, he's talking about live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And I think we could wrongly interpret that, therefore, we have no responsibility in those things. Like, it just just happens, okay? It just happens. Peter's point here is we have a responsibility. Knowing where we need to get to in our faith, that it's going to result in unconditional love for others, we need to supply these things, to go after them, to diligently pursue all of these things as we walk that road of sanctification so that we become more unconditionally loving people. Do we need to add a little bit of love in the church, y'all? No, we don't. We need to add a lot. We need to add a lot, okay? We need to grow. You know, I prayed earlier, and it was an absolutely sincere prayer. Um, I appreciate the community that God is developing in our church, and we are still a million miles from where we need to get to. It is encouraging, and it is challenging at the very same time. We need to continue to grow in our sanctification as individuals and as a church. Now, why is this so important? 
You guys know this scripture. You don't have to turn there. I want to read you a little bit out of 1 Corinthians 13. I've done this with you all before. But I just simply want you to understand the importance of love being the end result of the process, the mark that we're trying to hit. 1 Corinthians 13 says this, verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Not a beautiful chorus, just a bunch of noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and all my zeal, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing." Just so y'all know, I added the in all my zeal part, okay? Just, just so y'all know. I'm not trying to change scripture here, all right? Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 13, but now faith, hope, love, abide, these three... But the greatest of these is love. That is the mark of our faith. So you know what we got to do? I think we have to ask ourselves a hard, well, a couple questions. Here's the questions I want every single one of us to be asking this week, okay? If you want to write these down, if you want to post a note, you know, on your mirror when you're getting ready in the morning, stick them on your car dash, you know, tattoo it on your forehead backwards so you can read it in the mirror, like, whatever you need to do, okay, here's your, here's your questions, okay? Who can I love today? Second question, how can I show love to them? Do you all see how simple that is? Who, God, who do you want me to demonstrate love to today? I, I'm going to be willing to bet, too, you know, that there are going to be some interesting answers to that question that you would not predict if you really pray that. I think it's going to be really interesting how the Lord's going to answer that prayer. And then the second question, what do I do? How do I demonstrate love to them? I'm going to put you all on the spot right now. You all have been around enough to know that I don't do this all the time. How many of you are willing to ask those two questions as many times as you can this week? Let me see your hands. Okay. I'd like to hear the results from you all. I'd like to hear the results. Are you coming to get this back? Let's get back into the passage. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing. Remember, this is our responsibility to add these things. These are supposed to be continually increasing qualities in the life of faith over our sanctification as a believer. And so I do want you all to understand, and I want you all to hear this from me. This is not condemnation for every time you have failed to produce one of these characteristics. Y'all understand that, right? That's not where that that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to freeze us in our guilt and shame and condemnation for how we failed all these things every time in the past. We're talking about the Holy Spirit wanting to exhort us to drive us towards the goal that he has which culminates in our lives being lives of love for other people, all right? We're talking about being diligent. We're talking about our personal responsibility in these roles. And anything that would take you away from those personal responsibilities, including guilt and shame, are therefore, they become readily identified as spiritual warfare. Deception, accusation from the enemy to keep us reaching the goal that God has for each and every one of us. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of y'all want to be useful and fruitful to our Heavenly Father? Man, yes, yes. You know, like, like it, it, brings to, it brings to mind, you know, for me, uh, God's, when, where God looks at His children, He says, well done, my good and faithful servant, right? 
That, that's what we want to be. We are not perfect. We will not be perfect. But we can be useful and we can be fruitful. And we have a role to play in the process. Verse 9. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Now remind me, what's the definition for sins? Missing the mark. Okay. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten the purification from all the times that he missed the mark. From the very fact that who he was missed the mark until we were transformed, until we were regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Now, what we're talking about right here is assurance of our salvation. For those of you guys in the audience today who are struggling with your own assurance for your salvation, these are, this is a little bit of a litmus test. Okay? And I want you to know, we're not talking about a works-based salvation. Because remember, how does this whole process start? What's the foundation of all these qualities that we've just talked about? It's faith. Okay? It's faith. It's the faith that saves us. It's the belief, it's the confession of who God is and what He has done for us on the cross through Jesus Christ. That's where our salvation lies. But by definition, faith is a belief that leads us to action. Therefore, the partnership once again. That God saves us. He's the one according to this passage. Well, well let's get there in verse 10, okay? Be diligent, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the, the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Again, we're not talking about being saved by our works. We're talking about these qualities being evidence of our salvation so that we can look at ourselves and recognize that we've been saved. Just think about the passage itself, okay? Who gives us the power to do these things? God does. Who chose us? God did. Who called us? God did. Whose promises are these based on? God's. Okay. Everything points back to Him. He's the one that provides the power. But we have a partnership with Him to walk in these things. Okay. So I'm just trying to make sure that y'all do not get it twisted and start to believe that what we're talking about here is a salvation through our works. We're talking about the evidence of our salvation that is shown through our lifestyle, ultimately culminating in lives of love. Now, he uses one term in here that I want to point you back to. He says, man, if you're not growing in these things, perhaps you have forgotten the purification from your sins. Here's where we're going to close today. This is our final exhortation. Uh, and if you need to write a few things down that are not on the screen, that's fine. But here's the exhortation for every one of us as we go out today. Never forget. Never forget. Okay? Does anybody else lose their way sometimes because they just get distracted by what's right in front of them? You get distracted by school. You get distracted by work. You get distracted by relationships. You get distracted. You get distracted by things that are not even inherently bad. I mean, maybe some of you have been distracted by sin issues, but some of you have been distracted by things that can't even be good when they're in the right dichotomy, when they're prioritized in a correct way, but maybe they've kind of gotten out of order a little bit, and therefore they become distracting to us, okay? What, what are we never to forget? Well, according to Peter, he says, maybe some of you have forgotten about your purification from your sins, have we forgotten, have I forgotten about the depth of my sin? Have I forgotten how vile I am before God? You know, I made a point in a passage a couple weeks ago that Scripture several times tells us to resist the enemy, and yet it tells us over and over again to flee from our own lusts. Isn't that kind of interesting? So somebody came up after the service, and they were like, that is scary. Right, what do you mean? Well, if we're supposed to resist the enemy but flee from our own lusts, how bad are we? You know what I'm saying? Do not forget the purification from our sins. Do not forget how wicked we are apart from the work of the Holy Spirit of God in us. What are we never to forget? 
We cannot forget the consequences of our sin on ourselves and others. I want you to rest in that for just a minute. Do you remember when you've messed up royally? And do you remember what it cost? Do you want to continue to walk in that on a daily basis? Do not forget. Because sin breeds death. That's what it does. It cannot be played with. It cannot be trifled with. It has to be put away. It has to be killed. Do not forget the consequences of our sin. What can we never forget? We can never forget the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We have heard the story so many times that we have become numb to it. Should we ever grow numb to what Jesus did on our behalf that day on the cross? Absolutely not. And in fact, when it relates to us, Hebrews 12 verse 3 says, Hey, don't forget about the one who experienced the reviling at the hands of men. Don't forget about all the suffering of Jesus Christ so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The example of Jesus is meant to give us perseverance. It's meant to show us what love really looks like. And it's meant to cause us to endure. We cannot forget the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We can't forget the reward. We keep being told in Peter and Second Peter coming that we have an eternal reward stored up for us in heaven. That when he comes, when that day comes, that we have a great reward in front of us. Do not forget the reward. We can't forget who we want to be. I asked you guys a question. You didn't say a lot, but you indicated it by your body language. Do you want to be useful? Do you want to be fruitful to the Lord and to his kingdom? And I think the honest answer of the majority of this group was yes. All right? So let me pose that question to you one last time. And I want you to think about this for just a second. I want you to ask yourself before God right now, just in your own heart, who do I want to be? Do I want to be a man or a woman who's consumed by the world? Do I want to be a man or a woman who's consumed by greed and the love of money? Do I want to be a man or a woman who's consumed by a lust for power? Do I want to be a man or a woman who who wants to to, to benefit, you know, due to their own, you know, goodness or graciousness or morality or to be seen well by others or whatever the case may be? Or do I legitimately want to be a person who reflects the love of Christ, who is useful to the master, who has bought me by a great price? Do I want to be that person? You guys ever watch the documentary of anybody that you want want to talk about and you see all the practice and the time and all the things they put in to get to that place where somebody would make that thing about them and you watch that and you think, man, that's inspiring, right? Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? That's a question we all need to wrestle with. In that regard, let me pray for us this morning. Let, let, me, let me pray that that question and those questions about love will resound with us for a little while. Why don't you bow? Let me pray for you. Father God, we just confess right now that we need your help in this life of faith. And Father we have at least some understanding through your word that we have personal responsibility here, that we need to apply zeal, and that we need to add these things to our faith, Father, as we grow in the depth of our love for you and for others. And at the same time, at the same time, not not always fully understanding how they go together, but at the same time, we just confess our dependence upon you. Father, help us see. Help us see our shortcomings. Help us to see how we need to structure our lives so that we can add these things. Help us to see where our failings are. Help us to see where our strengths lie, where our spiritual giftings are so that we can use those in the battle. Help us to be rooted to your word, knowing that that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Help us by giving us a hunger and a desire for your word so that our zeal can be connected to knowledge. Help to fuel our zeal that even though we have knowledge, that as our faith grows, that you would remind us that you would stoke those fires and that we would fall back in love with our first love and that you would restore our zeal. However it is that you need to minister to each one of us. And Father, through this beautiful partnership between us and you, the foundation of which we're building on our faith. 
pray that ultimately the outcome would be that we would be a people, that we would be a universal church, and that we would be a local church that shows love to others. And, and not a love that just wants back, but an unconditional love, a, a giving love, a self-sacrificial love. Help, help us to hit the mark. Father, I pray for all my brothers and sisters in here that you'd remind us over the course of the week to ask the questions too. Who, who do you want me to love? How do you want me to love them? I pray in those times that you would, that you would speak. And I pray that you would give everybody in this room who, who's bold enough to ask the, or pray those prayers. I pray that you give them everything pertaining to life and godliness. I pray that you give them the integrity, the courage to go do what you ask them to do. We thank you, Father. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen.